We may have met earlier, but if not, my name is Dr. Sandra Jan, and I'm a member of the Site Congress Steering Committee. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this session titled, Elevating Efficacy with LAI Treatment in Schizophrenia, a focus on administration and adherence. This session is supported by an educational grant from Teva Pharmaceuticals. Now, while I introduce the speakers for this session, if you haven't already done so, please take just a moment to answer the polling questions. You'll see them right there on your screen. Now, depending on the device you're using, the questions are going to either appear to the right of the live stream or just below. These questions will be asked again at the end of the program. We appreciate your participation in answering the polling questions. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's session. Dr. Christoph Carell, Professor of Psychiatry and Molecular Medicine, Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, Investigator, Center for Psychiatric Neuroscience, Feinstein Institute for Medical Research, Medical Director, Recognition and Prevention Program, the Zucker Hillside Hospital, Northwell Health, in Glen Oaks, New York, and Dr. Rakesh Jan, Clinical Professor, Department of Psychiatry, Texas Tech University School of Medicine, Permian Basin, and also private practice here in Austin, Texas. The speakers will be presenting their session live, and at the end of this presentation, I'll come back to pose some questions for the audience, for all of you. You can type your questions in the Q&A box, you can also upvote the questions that are submitted by other attendees if you'd like to see their question answered. Doctors Carell and Jan will try to answer the most popular questions with the time that's remaining at the end of their session. Okay, so I think, Sandra, you, you just handed over to me. It's really a great pleasure having you all here. Obviously, it would be much more fun doing this in person. Again, I'm Christoph Carell. I'll read briefly our disclosure informations. Uh, first of all, there is some uh, off-label presentation of investigational drugs that have not been used before, and we'll highlight those. And we have faculty disclosure. Both uh, Rakesh and myself are fortunate to still work with uh, industry partners who are still operating in the brain. You may have realized a lot of them have left the brain, feeling that it's too hard to bring novel mechanisms of action to market and also beat the placebo effect. But we want novel medications. We need new formulations in order to improve the care and outcome of our patients even more. What are the learning objectives for today's presentations? It's a one hour block. We'll try to be concise so that we have at least 10 minutes at the end for your questions to make this lively, even though we're not in the same room together. We wanna to remove the mechanism of action of current and emerging long acting injectable antipsychotics for the treatment of schizophrenia. Evaluate the latest data and guidance informing the optimal use of LAI formulations for treatment initiation as well as maintenance, examining the data regarding patient outcomes with impact on treatment adherence, and then also integrate patient-centric communication and education tactics that support LAI-based therapy in real-world treatment plans. So I will start with talking about the burden of disease, adherence challenges, the role of LAIs, and then Rakesh will pick up on the very important piece of the role of communication in the initiation and maintenance of LAIs, because we may have the best treatments on earth, but if they're not getting to the patient, we have lost the battle. And I would pose to you that the four most efficacious treatments in psychiatry that have clear data that they're better than their competitors for specific situations are all underutilized. This is, Lithium, clozapine, long-acting injectable antipsychotics, and ECT. All four are superior to many of the treatments that our patients receive, although they should be getting exactly one of those four. And so hopefully after getting the talks today, you will feel better equipped at offering in a well-known way and with a lot of knowledge, LAIs to your patients. 
so I start with the burden of disease. I don't want to carry uh, uh, colds to Newcastle. You know that it's about depending on how you cut the pie between 0.7 and 1% of the population who have schizophrenia. That's in the United States, 1.7 to 2.4 adults. That's a lot of people in a stadium or more. Overall, the mortality risk is almost fourfold increased versus the general population. Obviously, uh, there is a suicide, 10 to 15% of people, but the biggest bulk is really cardiovascular illness and that we are not necessarily uh, educating patients on healthy lifestyle and also providing some care that might have more side effects than it should. But we also know that sick patients die more and we need to treat for efficacy. It's one of the top 15 causes of disability worldwide because schizophrenia hits early and pre prevents many patients from achieving their milestones. And obviously the cost is astronomical based on also the direct as well as indirect cost. Now we usually define our treatments based on the effect on positive symptoms. So even though the FDA gives approval for schizophrenia, this is not for positive symptom reduction, it's for the PANS total, which has positive symptoms, negative symptoms, but also 16 actually out of 30 general symptoms. So we need to parse this a little better. We have positive and negative symptoms, but also cognition is a problem, affective symptoms, and even motor symptoms. And I think in the future, when we get treatments that target each of those domains more or less, we will maybe get indications and also medications that we can combine in certain ways to improve subtypes of patients with more or less problems in each of the domains. You may be very aware that our treatment targets and goals have changed over the last 60 years. In the beginning, it was aggression and self-harm. Remember when clopromazine was serendipitously discovered, they were not called antipsychotics. People just saw the tranquilizing effects. They were called major tranquilizers, calming people down. And it took three years until people actually caught on to, well, they're not even talking about uh, delusions as much. And what about their hallucinations? So after the initial excitement about just calming people, there was a more specific effect on hallucinations and delusions. But then with the advent of second generation agents that cause less secondary negative symptoms, blocking dopamine less strongly, there was more of focus on negative symptoms as well as adverse effects. And then the last decade, we have seen an appropriate shift toward functionality away from just defining people based on symptoms. People are required to actually have social interactions, self-care, and also doing something meaningful with their time. And that is a target that we're struggling with meeting at the moment. But again, preventing people from relapsing may be one of the key considerations to achieve the other goals. So when choosing treatments, when presenting treatment options to patients and their families, we need to balance certain considerations, symptom control, symptom response and remission, relapse prevention, preventing or addressing treatment resistance with some of the softer items, adverse effects, comorbidities, ease of use, physical health, recovery, functionality, quality of life. But in order to get there, we need to also address patient preference and adherence. So what are the adherence challenges? Without adherence, we will not get the benefit of the treatment. So it's almost a truism, but I uh, put it here because it's a New England Journal of Medicine quote, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. And although this may feel like, oh, come on, well, what are you talking about? Well, we may assume far too often that patients actually take their medication. And what we often think is the ghastly genetics or the dynamic of the illness might be behavioral and might fly underneath our radar. So looking at some perspectives here, uh, we took in one of the, our papers uh, a patient in a family perspective that I'll read to you. So the patient stated, I was diagnosed as schizophrenic, which is obviously already not a good term because that defines the person by an illness. 
It's not I am schizophrenic, but I have schizophrenia. I think it's important to teach our patients that it's something that's not defining their identity. But here I was diagnosed as schizophrenic when I was 13. You know, early onset illness means harder to treat. I spent the better part of my adolescence and young adult adulthood in hospitals. I fought my disease and the stigma of mental illness in my struggle for employment. So even when patients get better, it's hard for them to get employed. They get demoralized. I learned from my mistakes, which cost me several jobs. And along my, with my psychiatrist, we experimented with different medications. Fortunately, we found a combination of meds which kept me out of the hospital and kept employment. So this patient actually is not talking about symptoms. This patient is talking about stigma and is talking about functionality, what he wants. And Rakesh will talk a lot about how to use what patients want into combining it with what we think is best for them. So the family perspective was, it seems that deciding to take medication is one thing for diagnosed people, but deciding to ensure that it's taken exactly as prescribed and at the exact right time is another issue entirely. My brother is proof of that. It's extremely difficult to keep track of many different medications simultaneously. As you know, schizophrenia is associated with cognitive problems. A single mismanaged dose can potentially lead to weeks of hardship. Going without has caused a lot of unnecessary hardship for my brother. And it's possible that some of his visits to the ER for psychological distress could have been avoided. And we know all of this, but are we actually addressing it enough with our patients? Well, one way to address non-adherence is to actually identify it. And there are different ways of doing this. The uh, name of the game at the moment is just ask the patient. Well, but you know, patient report may not be as accurate. And especially if you think, well, I have such a great relationship with my patient, why would they lie to me? The better your relationship, the less likely they may want to upset you and say, well, I, I know you want the best for me, but I think it's better for me not to take the medication. So I basically tell patients, from the beginning, I know that it's hard to take medication. Non-adherence is a human condition. I'm non-adherent to many things that I should be doing. So don't be embarrassed telling me about it. And let's, let's assume that it will be hard uh, so that they are more honest with me and don't feel like they're undermining the alliance by telling me that they really don't want to take the crap that I think is good for them. So self-assessment questionnaires, who knows, diaries, informant report is only going that far as, I, as they really know that they supervise the intake. Sometimes people say, yes, I, I give the medication to the patient, but it means leaving it on the nightstand, which really doesn't assure anything. Well, physician observed may or may not be better. Pill count, well, you don't know what people bring back. They could have thrown out the rest. Prescription refills tells you something, but only that they picked it up, not that they swallowed it. Observing ingestion can be helpful, but we've been fooled. Patients can be very good at hiding it on their molar or between uh, uh, their, their uh, mucous membranes and then spit it out. Uh, clinical response is not a good predictor of outcome, because of adherence rather, because uh, there is a delay often between stopping treatment and getting worse. Um, but obviously, if somebody has a lot of weight gain and then they suddenly stop, well, maybe it's not because they are biologically now immune to weight gain, but they stop the medication. Um, physiologic markers are hard to get by, and even therapeutic drug monitoring is inaccurate because if you have some level, you don't know how high it should be. Are patients taking every other dose? Have they stopped a week ago and now they start again because they, they know you take blood? Uh, and hair analysis is not far enough advanced. Now, having a chip in a pill may be one way of, of man monitoring this, the medication event markers, but you need to wear also um, a patch on the torso. It's all suboptimal. Actually, I would pose to you that there's only one single way of knowing 100% the month, the week, the day, the hour a patient becomes non-adherent. And that is prescribing a long-acting injectable. When they don't come back, the clock starts to tick and everybody knows. And that's a very powerful aspect of an LAI. They're as much an information tool as they are a treatment tool. Now, as you would assume, 
if you do serum concentrations, you get maybe almost twice as many more people picked up who has non-adherence than if you ask simply patients. So however you monitor non-adherence will give you a higher or a lower mark. Even patients who has considered treatment resistance, this is from a group in London that has a TRS clinic. They just drew blood and found that a third of their resistant patients were pseudo resistant. It's not that they, they didn't respond to the treatment, but they had actually suboptimal or zero blood levels. A third of those had zero blood levels. They said they are taking it. I can't deal with my illness. Doctors think they are prescribing it. So we really need to be better at monitoring adherence. And why? Because the most addressable, manageable, modifiable risk factor for poor outcome is the number of relapses, the duration of psychosis after treatment starts. And that is so much related to non-adherence and making non-adherence visible and addressing it with an LAI goes a very long way. Now we've become very interested in BAM, which is breakthrough on antipsychotic medication management and found that even when people are prescribed LAIs, there is a subgroup that will relapse. And who are those patients? it's often those with substance abuse because you're adding oil to the fire and then maybe even the doping blockade can't hold them. So identifying and managing addiction is very important too and getting people early into care. So efficacy is the spearhead of what we want. It's that what gets drugs approved by the FDA. They need to be tolerable but actually the hinge between efficacy and safety into the higher order outcomes, subjective well-being, quality of life, functional capacity is adherence. Obviously medication needs to be flanked by psychoeducation and psychotherapy, and we need to be good clinicians talking to our patients and uh, um, giving them psychoeducation about the value of treatment. And Rakesh will talk much more about that skill and art that I think we as psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and um, other mental health practitioners should be best at. So another case here for you to consider what would be your next steps in this case scenario. Carl is a 24 year old patient with schizophrenia since he was 19. He lives with his parents as often is the case. Carl had been stable on oral risperidone three milligrams per day. He stopped the medication though unbeknownst to psychiatrists and parents. He has started to hear voices again, has become very suspicious of two neighbors. Parents bring him to your psychiatric office seeking help to avoid a full relapse and rehospitalization. So here we're actually lucky that the parents have a little bit of their finger on the pulse and get the patient before he's fully uh, um, uh, relapsed. So you discover that he stopped the medication due to sexual side effects that he didn't talk about, as well as brain fog, which is one of the side effects patients don't like. Symptoms improve, but I feel not myself and you doc are doing it to me. So what would be your next steps in a patient like that? Well, you could obviously choose a medication that doesn't give a patient so many side effects on the sexual side effect realm or sedation, cognitive disability. But would there be other side effects? Would you know when the patient stops? Could you tell him next time, please let's discuss it. Will he do it? Do you do adherence therapy? Or could there also be a long acting injectable? So what factors actually influence non-adherence or adherence? Well, the illness and illness insight, patient factors of whether they uh, have basically a good alliance or want have goals that they can link with the treatment. Does the treatment have efficacy or side effects? Is there caregiver and social support? Does the clinician have alliance with the patient? Inpatient setting, obviously, it's much easier to monitor than outpatient setting. And people who are in clinical trials are generally more adherent because they know they are checked and they they um, are in agreement with a randomized treatment, often even with placebo. Now, when looking at multiple articles recently published and looking at reasons mentioned for non-adherence in this semi-quantitative review by Dawn Veligan, 
who has done a lot of research on adherence and non-adherence in schizophrenia, insight or lack thereof actually uh, was number one. And we, we have a hard time to actually improve no, uh, insight problems in patients when we treat them with antipsychotics. So psychosocial interventions are very important. Substance abuse is second, attitude toward medication third, medication side effects closely thereafter, cognitive impairment, therapeutic alliance, and family support, followed by stigma, functioning, depression, and mental health access. Why is non-adherence why are side effects important? Because they are basically very much linked to non-adherence. In this survey of outpatients, EPS or agitation, maybe akathisia, basically towered with a 43% uh, decrease in adherence. Metabolic side effects with a 36% decreased adherence. Prolactin, endocrine, sexual side effects a third. Sedation and cognition also and only GI side effects were not statistically significantly related with non-adherence. So side effects matter. We need to again educate patients and try to pick the safest medications possible. So this brings me then to the role of LAIs in order to maintain and make visible non-adherence and maintain adherence and maintain a good status in patients. Our main enemy toward the road of recovery and best outcomes is actually the ongoing psychosis and relapse in patients who have responded. Relapses are associated with long-term disability, increased suicide risk, decrease in treatment response, breeding so-called secondary treatment resistance. One in six to one in seven patients will not respond as well anymore after each relapse in schizophrenia. There will be progressive decline in brain structure and obviously cost to patients, families, burden, as well as to society. Can we prevent relapse with antipsychotic treatment? Yes, we can. In this very powerful and landmark meta-analysis by Stefan Leucht and his group published in Lancet, you can see that the number needed to treat to prevent one relapse when continuing an antipsychotic versus stopping was three. That is a number needed to treat that is unheard of in almost all medical conditions. To give you a frame of reference, aspirin or statins to prevent another cardiovascular event have a tenfold lower effect size of 35 to 45 patients requiring treatment with a statin or aspirin to prevent one relapse. But our medications are not created equal. Looking at the efficacy of oral treatments or long-acting injectable treatments versus placebo, you can see that the oral treatments cut the relapse about in half, whereas LAI treatments cut it down to one third, and that difference was statistically significant. So that brings me to the different LAIs that are available. Now, this is an overwhelming table. I understand it's table one in a very long paper that we put together, 24 pages on LAIs, maybe more than you ever wanted to hear or read about. But this table is useful because it gives you a little bit of a roadmap of the differences of the LAIs. We've updated it for this um, uh, presentation with some of the uh, LAIs uh, that we summarized in the CNS Spectrum paper. So basically we have the decanoates, which are the agents from the first generation, they are all oil-based, which is important because the cells contain more water than oil and you have more injection pain and injection pain reaction. Whereas all of the second generation agents are water-based uh, um, treatments. And here I put them in alphabetical order. We have differences obviously in injection intervals, uh, two weekly with rufenazine and risperidone uh, microspheres, one dose of olanzapine monthly with our piprazole maintena, as well as some forms of loroxol, as well as one form of paliperidone, and uh, a most recent subcutaneous version of risperidone, Perseris. Then we have six and eight weekly injections 
with uh, our epiprazole or Roxol, and then the three monthly injectable option with polyperidone, uh, polyperidone palmitate. Another difference is whether you need or don't need to give oral supplementation. And I'll go to another uh, table where we summarize this. Uh, basically, the um, first generation agents uh, are released pretty quickly. That's why they can also cause EPS. But in terms of the agents that are released more slowly and require oral co-treatment, it would be three weeks with risperidone microspheres as well as our epiprazole or Roxo. It would be two weeks with um, the uh, our epiprazole uh, maintainer or monohydrate, and one day when you combine our epiprazole or Roxo with our epiprazole Loroxyl Inicio, which is an extra injection, and two other medications have either an extra injection or a higher dose, and that's polyparid or palmitate. At day seven, you get a booster injection, and olanzapine starts at higher dosages. So the risperidone uh, um, Perseris, though, would not need any co-treatment, as well as risperidone ISM, which was recently uh, finished the phase three trial program in Europe that's uh, developed by Rovi. It also has just one injection deep intramuscular to begin with. And then at two or three days, you reach steady state. We also have a new medication formulation that is tested with risperidone as a subcutaneous version. That is Teva's drug TV4600, which is tested in two different dosages, which might then become the second subcutaneous antipsychotic, which may actually decrease some of its stigma and also resistance by patients and prescribers. And you may have heard that polyperidone is currently being tested as a six monthly injectable that could be given just twice a year. How well do LAIs do against usual care antipsychotics or prior antipsychotics? This is from a meta-analysis of 25 trials and 6,000 patients, where we looked at a design that matches your clinical care. We don't randomize our, treat, our patients to Mr. Jones that gets an oral treatment and Mr. Miller who gets an LAI and then we compare them. No, that's not how we clinically operate. We take Mr. Jones and say, well, you're not doing so well on the current treatment. Let me make a change. And then we compare the after with the before. And that's a powerful design because you take the patient at their own control, meaning their genetics don't change, their environment generally don't cha doesn't change. And these studies are called mirror image studies. And not only did we find that there was a significant and strong superiority in the long acting injectable period in the same patient versus the oral period, we also found that 23 of the 25 studies in and of themselves showed the same thing, meaning there was high consistency. Even though there was heterogeneity, how strong the effect was, 23 out of 25 trials showed the same thing, independent of a meta-analysis. That's very rare to find in any meta-analysis where you usually pool small effects on small effects on small effects to finally get over the finish line. This was not necessary for this kind of comparison. Now we upgraded this and actually looked at 100,000 patients, not 6,000 and uh, 42 trials. Here the follow-up was not six months to 12 months, but actually 18 months. And these are cohort studies where clinicians decide for a cohort of patients, well, you're fine on an oral because you're not so severely ill, you haven't had that many relapses or you get an LAI. So we're stacking the deck against the deck, basically. But despite that, that patients on LAIs were sicker, we still found a significant advantage of the LAI group versus the oral group in more real world patients. One of such studies um, actually was a, a real world study that took 100% of patients in a certain period of time in the entire country. So there is no randomization bias, no study bias, it's everybody. 
It's a very powerful design because they have registers and you have everybody who you can follow for years, not months. So here the median follow-up was seven years. And interestingly, in these 30,000 patients, out of the 10 best treatments to prevent hospitalization, eight, eight out of the 10 were all long-acting injectables chosen by clinicians like you and I, eight of the 10 best treatments are LAIs. The two that were not long-acting injectables were oral clozapine and polytherapy. And we can talk about polytherapy if you're interested because we followed up with Yari and his group uh, on another um, uh, study to look at polypharmacy. But in the study, just choosing a different formulation like an LAI versus an oral treatment gave a 20 to 30% lower hospitalization risk than the oral treatment. So these are very strong data. But when should we actually start considering LAIs? Well, this study from Finland suggests even in the first episode. Here patients who were admitted for the first time, again, 100% of first episode patients in the study period were followed after discharge. And it was shown that although the sicker patients, again, got the LAI that had been non-adherent before, that had poorer social network, even though they were given LAIs, they still had less all-cause discontinuation and the relapse rate was cut down to one third. Powerful, naturalistic, real world data. But real world data will not change guidelines. What changes guidelines is RCTs. And this is a very, very nice RCT because it compared the exact same medication, risperidone, either as a long acting injectable or an oral formulation. And what you can see here is that one out of three observed patients had a relapse on the oral risperidone versus five out of 100. Well, if you had a brother, a cousin, a sister, an uncle, would you want one out of three relapses or five out of 100? But then you may look at the graph and say, Dr. Correll doesn't know even what he's presenting. I see 0.5, which means 50%. Well, you are right. When doing the right statistical analysis, which is called Kaplan-Meier survival curve analysis that everyone is followed for exactly a year, the relapse is 50%, one out of two versus eight out of 100. That's a 42% absolute risk reduction a 600% relative risk reduction. If the oral risperidone were a cancer drug, this drug would be removed from the market today because it would be seen as giving such poor outcome. But still our paradigm is still almost always oral. In the United States, 10 to 15% of people with schizophrenia get an LAI. Is that the right way of dealing with a chronic relapsing illness? But even when patients stop medication, there is a longer window of opportunity that they don't relapse. This is a complicated slide because it's the placebo arm of three different studies that are added to the same graph. In the dark color, we have patients who had been stabilized on oral polyperidone. Obviously once a day half-life, a week later it's out of the blood. It takes only two months until half of the patients have to be removed from the study because they're close to relapsing or have relapsed. The green line is patients who had been stabilized on one monthly polyperidone. So here it takes four to five months to actually get totally out of the system. And the median relapse rate is seven months. And then the top blue line is the three monthly polyperidone. And so it's the same medication, just a different formulation. And here it takes actually 13 months until 50% relapse. So even when patients stop, A, we know it and we can get families involved or ACT teams and have outreach to get them back, but we extend the window of opportunity to actually bring them back into care. But we can't talk about efficacy without consideration of safety. So this is a meta-analysis we conducted on safety in patients who are randomized to either the oral formulation or the LAI formulation of the same drug. And out of 119 side effects, 97% were not higher in the LAI group, even though you give all the medication at once, which is often a fear. 
that clinicians and patients have. There were three side effects that were higher in the LAI group. Akinesia, maybe because of the first generation agents, some EPS. LDL cholesterol, well, patients are compliant, so they have more weight gain, but also more anxiety, which I really can't explain. And then there was also a lower risk of side effects of hyperprolactinemia and prolactin elevation, which is very much related to the peak level of the antipsychotic. But the ultimate side effect of life is death. And unfortunately, quite a number of patients with schizophrenia die, but the death rate is faster and higher in people who are not on antipsychotics, paradoxically here in the green line, and interestingly, people die more, not only of uh, suicides, but also of cardiovascular illness. This, that's related to weight gain. Even though we can give weight gain and metabolic abnormalities with medications, still patients of antipsychotics die more of cardiovascular illness. They are sicker, have poor healthy lifestyle, don't see doctors, and have inflammation because they are under psychotic stress. The middle group are first generation agents and the best outcome in delaying relapses was in patients who got second generation agents and the very best, the red line, paradoxically, maybe alert, you should give it, are long acting injectables from the second generation because they're the farthest away from no treatment. So putting the risk of death as one for orally treated patients who pick up the prescription from the pharmacy we don't know whether they're taking it, comparing that against patients prescribed oral treatments who are not picking it up from the pharmacy, the risk of death is, de is increased by 25 to 75%. But then comparing patients who go to the pharmacy picking up the medication orally versus those that get it as an LAI, the same medication, the risk of death is decreased with the LAI by 12 to 51%. So now you can tell patients an LAI doesn't only reduce relapse rates, hospitalization, it also makes you live longer. And that's, I think, a big point to achieve goals that you may want to achieve. So here, the final uh, point before I hand over to Rakesh. Joe is a 28-year-old single man who was diagnosed with schizophrenia at the end of his senior year in college. His symptoms were mainly delusions and intermittent hallucinations, which appeared not to respond well to a number of different oral antipsychotics. It was unclear if Joseph took his medications consistently. How often could you or I say that about our patients? More often than not, how clear is it that they really take it, want to take it? Prior to his illness, he had been doing well and had been, had been accepted even to law school. The first year of law school, he continued to have symptoms and was unable to complete the year He's now brought to a new psychiatrist for a second opinion. So this was a high functioning patient. Those patients in the first episode and early phase have the most to gain and the most to lose. And with each successive relapse, there is self stigma, demoralization and erosion of the psychosocial fabric and also the opportunities. So preventing this should be our primary goal. So I hand over to you Rakesh to take it from here. And then I look forward to a lively discussion. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sandra, for the lovely introduction. Christoph, I love working with you. I do. And there are two main reasons. One, you're bright as heck. That's obvious to everybody. But there's a humanism about you and an approach to medicine that has humility in it. We may have very effective medications as the tip of the spear, as you said, but the hinge, the one that makes or breaks the treatment is actually adherence. You could have a hidden Christoph behind p-values and effect sizes, but you did not do that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll also share, I'll also share this with you, Christoph. One of my very, very, very first professors was Leo Hollister. He's the gentleman who brought Haldol, Haloperidol to psychiatry, came from Stanford to our university. He transferred over. First lecture, here we are. We were so excited. We're going to hear about all kinds of psychopharmacology and all the beauty that we will learn about all these new medications. And this is what he said. 
if non-adherence were a disorder in DSM, it would be the number one disorder. He said, no matter what you do in your career, learn the art of communication and increasing adherence. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to talking about it with you. Let me see if I can get control of the slides and I will do so now. So check this out. This is the state of the art. Come on, Christoph gently, He's a gentleman, but if you think about the message, it's damning. Only 10 to 15% of our fellow citizens who have schizophrenia are receiving a long acting. But if you ask clinicians, they say, I told them to take it, they won't take it. But what was the problem? Well, 91% focused just on the shot. And if they did that, only, only 33%, only a third of the patients accepted it. However, however, if you go back to the patients who said no, and they were actually informed about the benefits of this medication using, we'll talk about that in a second, motivational interviewing, 96%, 19 out of 20 said, okay, that's a good idea. So you want 10 more drugs that are very effective? Christoph said it, and I agree with him. It's not going to work unless we learn the art of adherence enhancement. And there's a very large discrepancy. Look at the study from only three years ago, which tells us we have a certain belief system. We, the clinicians, have a belief system that's in purple. But if you look at yellow, which is the patient's concern, if they're on medications, it's not actually as bad as we think it is. And the beautiful thing is if you look at the dots in green on all these parameters, it's going to hurt. It's going to bind me to the clinic. There'll be stigma. I'm going to feel controlled. Oh my gosh. No, that was not the case. We're speaking two different languages. Our patients are speaking a slightly different language than we are. So to test it out, here's your group, sir. I'm so pleased to present this. Your group up in New York, where you folks did a study looking at site training, staff site training, and then teaching them the art of a variety of techniques from motivational interviewing, the pre-relapse study. They taught about what is non-adherence, why does it happen, what is shared decision-making, all of those important things. Would you like to take a look at if that made any difference? Check it out. So some patients did refuse, but instead of being 91%, it was 14.4% and received at least one long acting injectable medication, 91%. Patients didn't change, medications didn't change. You know what changed? The clinician's approach to the patient. So here we go. Let me offer you a case. This is a very typical patient-clinician discussion. Would you like a shot? You think you should get a shot? You've not been good about your medications. You don't want to be hospitalized, do you? How about a shot? And this is what the patient says. Listen, I don't ever want to talk about those shots. I think they're stupid. I just won't take them, okay? And this is sadly happening very, very often. Just take a shot is the wrong conversation starter. So what do we do? When in doubt, go back to the French. Here is... Blase Pascal, he was a typical polymath. He was not just a philosopher, a mathematician, astronomer. My goodness, in those eras, they were doing everything. And this is what he said. This is some years ago, 400 plus years ago. People are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those who have come into the minds of others. Now, I do understand there are risks with schizophrenia where the mind and the thought process has betrayed them. But please don't be surprised. Even the sickest patient definitely has capabilities at making decisions. We just have to find a way to get them there. So motivational interviewing, what is it? We do need to talk about it. You and I need to know p-values. We need to know mechanisms of action. We need to know effect sizes. All of those are critical. You have heard me talk about it because they're important. But without understanding this, who are we but people who recommend things but not really help the person get better? 
So motivational interviewing, we'll talk a bit more about that in a second, has these following four blocks, collaboration, acceptance, compassion, and of course, evocation. And all of these go back and forth, as I will show you in enhancing the relationship between the clinical team, not the clinician, but the entire clinical team and the patient, and not just the patient, but the patient and their support system. So why did this come about? And this is very interesting because this is when I grew up in the 80s in the medical field. I was trained in India. The best professors, we were told, were the ones who were quiet. They were. The quieter they were, we thought there's a word in Hindi called Gambhir, which literally means silent and thoughtful and non-communicative. Guess what? That was thought to be a strength of a psychiatrist or an internal medicine specialist. I adopted that. You adopt what your professors teach you. And what happened is actually something that this gentleman who himself discovered the power of motivational interview discovered, Dr. Miller, he talked about being authoritarian was the older model. Patients were the problem if they didn't take their medication. So he changed things. He started listening to his patients. He actually tried to get the patients to understand on their own with guidance from a clinician why certain options are better. And this led to the following, as you can read for yourself. I won't read it to you. Yes, it is more challenging with, with schizophrenia. It really is. But this learned helplessness we sometimes have developed, data doesn't show that. Christoph showed that to you. I showed you actual studies of patients not changing, but clinicians changing their approach. And the numbers go from 30 some percent adoption to 90 some percent. What happened if not for the clinician? So motivational interviewing, as I said before, is not a psychiatry gift, if you will. It actually has been used in many settings. American smoking has gone from 51 some percent 30, 40 years ago to in many states, 17, 18%. What happened? One of the big factors is clinicians and their art of using motivational interviewing to help their patients who are smokers give up on it without feeling threatened. If we can do that with all these disorders, could we not do it with schizophrenia, especially when, what did, what did Christoph say? The single greatest side effect of life is death. For schizophrenia, it is sometimes that and death while living. And what often stands between a person with schizophrenia and hell on earth or even death actually often is their medication. So let's have this interview again, but we'll do it slightly differently. This time the clinician engages the patient slightly differently. Oh, you have worries. I wanna talk about it. But before we talk about your worries, let me just ask you, what has this disease taken away from you? What are your hopes, wishes, dreams? Engage the person, acceptance of the medication, compassion that, yeah, I too don't want to have to come see my clinician three times a week. I too hate being kicked out of my brother's home again. But how can we collaborate? How can we accept the facts as they are? Compassion and of course, evocation. Maybe this sounds non-scientific to you, but I hope it doesn't. I really hope it doesn't. These principles, the art of psychiatry is not psychopharmacology. It's a combination of psychopharmacology, humanism, and part of humanism is the gentle art of persuasion for the patient's benefit, never coercion. So expressing empathy has been so important. Roll with the resistance. Patient says, no, okay, I understand. But let me explain my position. You think about it. We'll just check it out. We'll think about it. Those are also important things. And then find gentle discrepancies between what they want and how they are actually doing. And finally, you are in control. 
I'm advising you, you are in control. So many patients with schizophrenia very sadly feel the police are in control, the social worker is in control, and here's another mental health professional who's going to tell them what to do. So because of time, I won't go into these in detail. Open-ended questions, man, they do work. They do work. Gentle, open-ended questions, listening reflectively. They may be psychotic, but that's all they are. There's still a human being with thoughts, emotions, desires inside there. And please, please resist this reflex called the writing reflex. I sadly am afflicted with a terminal case of it, and I'm working very hard to correct it, which is I'm going to tell you how to do things because I am right. Try this. Try this out. This is absolutely the wrong writing reflex, is it not? What, shot? You worried about shot? Come on now. My five-year-old grandson takes it. Psh, you're a 30-year-old man. Come on, man up. That is a perfect recipe for disaster. What are you going to do with the best medications in the world if we don't have the motivational interviewing down? I hope you will took, look at the notes because Christoph and I worked pretty hard on offering you a full data package on how to improve all kinds of skills. And there's, of course, another slightly different approach called the GAIN approach. I've no doubt, Christoph, you're very familiar with it. If this sits better with you, I have no trouble with it. Goal setting, action planning, initiating treatment, nurturing motivation. All the elements of motivational interviewing are present here. So I'll just give you some details to look at what actually goes in it and never ever tell people shots don't hurt. If they believe it hurts, it's better to say they can but what is your actual fear? How long does the pain last? And how long does the pain of becoming ill again last? You compare it, John. That kind of approach is so much better. So that's my advice to you. Take motivational interviewing as quality care, part and parcel of the best things we do. And with long acting injectables, as Christophe has said, I mean, 10 to 15%, that is astoundingly poor. We are, the richest country in the nation. These are embarrassing numbers. This is not good. And by the way, I do want to say we're all responsible and we're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. So if you have a treatment team, the one who's not fully accepting is the one who is most challenged by it. Let's not let this happen. So in conclusion, what I would say is obviously, Christoph, I'm not going to conclude your section. It was done brilliantly. The case you made, it's a case closed situation. From a medical perspective, that is what we ought to be doing. And from a biopsychosocial perspective, we will have to up our game. All of us, all of us, your prescriber, non prescriber, it doesn't matter. We will have to up our game. Uh, what did you say, Christoph? C. Everett Coop's great quote medicines don't work for people who don't take them. And in schizophrenia, people who don't take their medications, I'm afraid. The future is poor, but taking the medications, the future is so much better. And LAI is in many ways, the case is really very, very strong. So with that, thank you for your kind attention. And I'll turn it back to you, Sandra, for your Q&A for Christoph and myself. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, I'm just sitting here trying to pull myself together for Q&A because I feel like I'm sitting with one of my patients and, um, such a powerful presentation from both of you gentlemen. But before we get to your questions, our audience's questions, I wanna ask you, please be sure to take just a moment to answer the polling questions. And as you know by now, they're right there on your screen, I believe to the right. We really appreciate you participating in the polling questions. They're very important to us. So let's now turn our attention to Q&A, which I have a feeling is going to be very interesting. Christoph and Rakesh, are you both ready? Yes, ma'am. All right. So let's kick it off with the question. And I don't think you're going to be surprised about this. It's about adherence. Uh, such an important area of concern that you both talked about. So one of our attendees asks, when it comes to non-adherence, should we as clinicians address these challenges early on rather than waiting until the problems present. And one more question, 
And should we involve the patient's support team, their family, the people, their friends, colleagues in the conversation? I'd love to toss this one out to you, uh, Christoph, if you if you'd be so kind as to share your thoughts. Sure. The short answer is yes and yes. The long, <laughs> the long answer is um, I think we need to do preemptive medicine and not reactive medicine. Uh, since non-adherence is so common, waiting for it to occur is one step too late. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to be involved in the Florida guidelines for schizophrenia, and this is now the, the most advanced guideline where we say even in the first episode, when a patient is on an oral antipsychotic, responds to it, tolerates it, takes it, you still can change and should change them likely to an LAI to prevent things from happening poorly in the long run. And one, one very powerful uh, psychological moment is we all forget to take it one time or another. Or on the weekend, we take a break because I want to take my drug, not your drug. What happens? No relapse, but I have less side effects. So not taking it feels good in the short term and is reinforcing. And basically, we lose patience. And then when the relapse happens three or six months down the road, they don't put two and two together. It's because of the stress, the marijuana, but not because I stopped your bad medication that makes me feel bad. So when you have somebody on an LAI, you can link the good outcome back to the medication taking. So it's a different approach. And Rakesh, your thoughts on this question? How can I add a single word of information to that, Sandra? I would, however, add this. Non-adherence is a problem. Partial adherence is a problem. So we, if you really want to combat both those challenges, and if anything, partial adherence may be as big a monster as full non-adherence. You don't get to full non-adherence often without going through the, the gates of hell of partial <laughs> adherence. Uh, injectables make sense. So yes, I would say involve the family. And the reason why family involvement is necessary, I think is twofold, not just to remind, but also family often is the cause of the patient not taking the medication because they don't understand the disease or don't understand injection. Really? They want to put a needle into your body. Do you remember our uncle who was arrested by the police? And when he went to the jail, they put him face down and shoved a needle in his butt. You want to let Dr. Correll do that to you? So do you see they can become allies or they can become significant challenges, involve the family? Great suggestions. Now here's a question for both of you. This clinician is asking both of you, will you please share with all of us your top three suggestions on how to best overcome patient resistance to long acting injectables? So Rakesh, would you feel this one first? Yeah, and Christoph, you don't know this, but this will be helpful for you to hear this. So I'm on a long acting injectable and I'm on a long acting injectable for a different disease state, rheumatoid arthritis, not on it anymore, uh, but Sandra knows uh, how long I fought it, won't take it. And here's why, I was afraid of the pain. I was also afraid to admit how sick I had gotten. And it required a nurse and my spouse to gently use literally motivational interviewing to look at my fears. My clinician uh, actually said, okay, when you're ready for your injections, come in. So he, without meaning to sort of let me down. So the first technique I would recommend, Sandra, is don't even ask people, do you want a shot? That's the wrong approach. I think it's so much better to find out from them, what do they seek from treatment? Once you have those goals, then offer them. Well, what Dr. Christoph said, this is the benefit and the problem with just taking or pills. They won't call it oral medications. This is the benefit of taking it a very different way. And I like to call it different way before I say injections. And the different way is one that lasts, blah, 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 blah. And it is an injection which may hurt, but most of my patients say it doesn't hurt. Um, and then I say, if, if what you just said to me, your goal is to be ABC, it makes sense to me that you may wanna strongly consider it. What are your thoughts? Because always you are in control, I'm here to help you. 
So Christoph, would you would you maybe edit what I said, add or subtract from the approach I take? No, I think this is perfect. I, I would just try to add something to it. So you have to be convinced to be convincing. <laughs> and so if you if you don't believe, you can't convey it. Uh, so I would start saying, well, uh, would you want a medication where you have less time in the hospital? You don't have to go to the emergency room. You can live longer. You get less medication in your body. Would you want that? Yes, I want it. Give me the prescription. Only then would I start saying, well, actually, it's not a pill. And the second last would be, if you were my son or daughter, I would want you to be honest and be honest and look someone in the eye and believe it. And the last one would then be, okay, you've resisted my talking to you multiple times at multiple shots at the goal and I wasn't successful. Now we've worked together for a while. Um, just try it once, do it for me. Just try it. If you, if you don't like it, you can stop. I, I will be off your back. But get them to try it once because our fears of the unknown is so much higher than continuing something that you've once weathered. Thank you both so much. This is going to be so valuable to our viewers. You know, there's there's another question that is specific to motivational interviewing. I know that we are we're really pushing the clock, but I just don't want to pass this one up. And this is an area, Rakesh, that you were talking about motivational interviewing. And here's the question. Um, what do you think the barriers are for us as clinicians in really utilizing the practice of motivational interviewing? What gets in the way of us doing that and doing it well? Training. I, I do think there is a, uh, there is, uh, when it comes to motivational interviewing, a passion deficit disorder that is a pandemic amongst us. The passion for it. Uh, I think we are appropriately enamored by science, but motivational interviewing is science. Science is psychotherapy in part as well. So this passion deficit disorder, knowledge deficit, I don't think is as much a challenge as much as, as Christoph said, you can convince unless you are convinced yourself. And, and our hope is you are convinced. The data is actually, if this was a court of law, Guilty. Would you agree, Christoph? Yes. Yeah. Well, let me, I hate to do this. I mean, it just seems wrong given the fact that there are so many questions left, but we are just pushed right up against our stop time. I want to thank both of you, Dr. Correll and Dr. Jan, for joining us this afternoon. This has just been an outstanding presentation. And even though short, it was a robust Q&A. So thank you both. Thank you, Sandra. Bye, Christoph. Take care. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Looking forward to more of it. Yes. Now, up next, we have a quick 15-minute break before the next set of sessions begin. So please check out the live agenda page to see which innovation theater you would like to attend. Remember, attending select innovation theater sessions is going to earn you points towards that Passport to Prize competition. So please visit the Passport to Prizes page for full contest details. Please enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>